Dennis Hartman is a professor here at the University of Washington who has been involved with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the most, most recent assessment report. We'll talk a little bit about that. And Dennis is going to essentially give us the, the overview the, of the global hot topics, we'll call it, the, kind of taking that big perspective, the latest on the global climate science and addressing some of the, the big issues that have been in the media as of late. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. It's lovely to be here with you this morning. Uh, my agenda for today is to give you a little bit of an introduction to IPCC uh, and then talk about some of the, <clears throat> what I think are the new things uh, that have come out and have been talked about recently, particularly salinity in the hydrologic cycle, CO2 release and warming relationship, the hiatus in warming, and then I was asked to do something about the impacts assessment, uh, working group two, but uh, I found there wasn't time to do that. So I'm just going to give you a web page at the end where you can go read up on it yourself if you're interested. So what is the IPCC? It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, established in 1988 with the task of assessing in a comprehensive, objective, open, and transparent basis the scientific technical and socioeconomic information relevant to the understanding of the scientific basis, that's working group one, potential impacts, working group two, and options for adaptation and mitigation, working group three. Uh, what is AR5? This is the fifth time around. Uh, the fifth assessment is just being completed now. The first one was completed in 1990. It's still not quite done. The synthesis report, the synthesis of the three working groups will become available uh, next month. So uh, from my perspective, from working group one, which is the physical science basis, this started in 2009. I became involved in 2010 when the authors were selected. Uh, we dealt with uh, roughly 55,000 reviewer comments, which was the hardest part about it. There are 14 chapters. There's a summary for policymakers of 14,000 words, which was reviewed word by word by uh, government delegates. And I'll show you a few pictures of that to give you an idea of what that was like. And then there are 19 uh, headlines. And I'll show you a few of the headlines now just to review the basic information. A lot of the basic science has not changed. There's not anything particularly new. This is our first uh, lead author meeting of Working Group One. We uh, met in Kunming, China. That's me there in the back row. <laughs> I always put the tall guys, big tall guys in the back row. And for me, uh, the process ended in uh, Stockholm uh, this past September, where we presented the uh, summary for policymakers to the government uh, delegates. We uh, did it in the Munich Brewery, which has been converted into a uh, conference center. Uh, the meeting plenary was held in the main hall with uh, simultaneous translation. At the front of the room, there was uh, in the center the co-chairs of Working Group One. To the right, as you look at it, the uh, scientists on the, on the left, some of the people from the support group. So we would put a paragraph or a couple of sentences up on the board in yellow. And uh, the uh, delegates would then, if they wanted to, raise their flag, like Australia here is raising their flag, and they'd say, well, you know, what's that mean? I don't like that word. Uh, we should change it to this. And there would be a bunch of discussion, and there would be some uh, uh, votes held. And uh, when nobody raised their flag, the co-chairs would gavel it down, and we'd move on to the, to the next uh, document. So the co-chairs had a very important role, and if the flags kept go going up and it took too much time, then the uh, <coughs> co-chair would say, okay, you guys go off in a room and sort this out and come back when you've got something you can agree on. So the protagonist and the antagonist on that particular issue would be sent off to a room, they'd come back. There'd be no actual votes, it's sort of by assent. And as they went off into the rooms in the back, some scientists from the group that were there for that particular issue would go with them. And I thought it was uh, a very encouraging process because, for, I'll give you an example, like the, the delegate from Brazil said, okay, it says in the document that um, deforestation 
is causing an increase in CO2 and the regrowth in forests in high latitudes is causing a decrease in CO2 and those two things sort of balance. So let's just fuse it together and say deforestation has no impact on CO2. <laughs> and uh, so the turn to the scientists and the scientists said there's no physical connection between those two things, we should not conflate them and we moved on, right? So the science, the basic facts sort of uh, won, I thought. I thought it was a really good process. I uh, enjoyed it. So let's, let's talk about a few of these headlines. Here's a familiar plot which shows as a function of time, decadal averages of global mean land surface temperature and the statement, the headline is each of the last three decades have been successfully warmer at the Earth's surface than any preceding decade since 1850 and then something uh, specifically for the sort of argument that things were warmer in the past. In the Northern Hemisphere, 1983 to 2012, I think that's a 30-year period, was likely the warmer 30-year period in the last 14,000 years medium confidence. And every statement has a confidence associated with it, except the first one there. That doesn't have a confidence associated with it because we regard it as being a fact, 99.9 percent .9 certain. Uh, global warming, whatever you look at, it indicates global warming, so warming the climate system is unequivocal. That was a statement that we brought forward from the previous IPCC in 2007. That's just showing the trend over the globe. It's warming pretty much everywhere. The human influence on the climate <coughs> system is clear. This is based on the fact that uh, if you take a climate model, you can't simulate the warming of, of the last 30 years unless you include greenhouse gases that have been introduced by humans. Uh, then projections for the future, there are scenarios there. The blue scenario is uh, what if, if we did everything that we could to keep the global mean temperature from exceeding a two degree warming. And then the red line is the more or less the path we're on now, the sort of business as usual, uh, consume fossil fuels at the highest economically viable rate basically is what we're doing, right? So under any of those scenarios, we're still going to get a degree and a half warming relative to uh, 1850. Global mean sea level is going to rise, going to continue to rise in the 21st century. Uh, on the red scenario there, uh, up to uh, looks like uh, 0.775 meters, roughly speaking, by the end of the century. And this is sort of a complicated talk, and it's one of the new complicated talk. That's true also, but it's an also complicated figure. And what it's showing is uh, there was a pointer here with a laser beam and it seems <coughs> to have disappeared. Do you know where that went? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, obviously, I got something else. <laughs> so this is the temperature anomaly relative to a reference period of 1861 to 1880. And this is the cumulative total anthropogenic CO2 emissions from 1850. And on here is the blue scenario and the red scenario and two intermediate scenarios. And you can see that they more or less stay on the same line. So the notion is that it doesn't matter how fast or how slow you release the CO2, the warming is linearly related to the total release of CO2. So it's not going to help us to slow down how we put out the CO2, we have to limit the total amount. That's kind of an important um, point in terms of uh, mitigation. Uh, sea level uh, is uh, continuing to rise and the melting of the large ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica is beginning to make an increasingly important contribution. The, um, Blue and the green line here are the contributions of Greenland and Antarctica, and those are ramping up, and we have direct observations from satellites that indicate that those uh, large ice sheets are melting away. Another interesting um, trend that's been observed uh, is to a certain extent present in the previous IPCC report, but it's been greatly solidified recently, is that the trend in ocean salinity it's getting saltier where it's already salty and it's getting fresher where it's currently fresh. And that means that the contrast in the hydrologic cycle is increasing, right? Where evaporation is greater than precipitation, 
evaporation is increasing faster than precipitation, and where precipitation is greater than evaporation, precipitation is increasing faster. And that's consistent with one of the main um, predictions of climate models, which also you can explain using relatively simple scientific logic, and that is the wet get wetter, dry gets drier paradigm of climate change. So where it's currently wet now when you have heavy rains, you're going to have heavier rains in the future. Where you have marginally dry climates in the present, they're going to get more dry. So the contrast in the system is going to increase. The total amount of precipitation evaporation doesn't change very fast, but the contrast increases, and that's re directly reflected in salinity observations, which are a kind of integrator of the hydrologic cycle, right? Because evaporation takes fresh water of the, out of the ocean, precipitation provides fresh water to the ocean. If evaporation exceeds precipitation, the ocean gets saltier at the surface. And we can now observe that happening. And as I mentioned, this is uh, consistent with the wet gets wetter, dry gets drier. So on the top is the change in E minus T between now and the end of the century. And so the red areas indicate where it's getting drier and the blue area is where it's getting wetter. So it gets wetter in high latitudes, it gets drier in the subtropics, and this has big impacts on the soil moisture um, in the subtropics and on the sort of poleward edge of the subtropics. The dry zones are expanding and getting more, uh, will expand and get more extreme uh, in the future. Arctic sea ice is declining. Uh, these lateral lines are some sort of a PDF error. If we stay on the uh, business as usual scenario, uh, it's predicted that Arctic sea ice will be uh, gone in September by roughly the middle of this century. Hopefully that'll go away. Nope. There are two buttons there, so you got to be really super careful what you touch. You want to do that? Can't press too hard. Uh, yeah, that one's good. Okay, I'll stop doing that. Ocean acidification's going to get pretty bad uh, if we stay on the red scenario, which is business as usual, which is what we're on now. Um, let me then move to the hiatus, which has gotten a lot of press recently. That is the reduced warming since 1998. So that's the observed record there in black. The red line is the most recent uh, set of computations that were used in AR5, and the blue line is the previous IPCC. So at the end there, in the last uh, decade or so, there's a gap between what the models predicted would happen and what has actually happened. And we call it the hiatus in uh, Zurich, they call it die Klimapause, I learned. Interesting. So, uh, and the model suggests that that reduced trend is significant. So shown on the left is the decade 1998 to 2012, right 1984 to 1998. The gray bars are what an ensemble of models predict, right? So every model has some kind of natural variability. So there's going to be a range of warming over those 15-year periods that the models predict. And the red is what actually happened according to the had t 4 observation. So for the 98 to 2012 period, they're right at the edge. The observations are right at the edge of what the models predicted. So it's a little bit outside the expected range. On the other hand, for 1994, 1998, they were on the other side. Uh, the warming was actually bigger than the peak that the models uh, predicted. Interesting aspect of the uh, hiatus is it's primarily a northern hemisphere wintertime phenomenon. Uh, let's just focus on the two on the right. The top one is northern hemisphere winter, October, November, December, January, February, ja uh, whatever, yes. I don't know what the J is doing in there. Okay. And the bottom is the summer. And the red line is the trend over the entire period. And the little blue line is the trend over the last 15 years. And you can see that the bottom, the summer, the summer is going up more or less at the same uh, rate as uh, the long term uh, average. So that's one of the aspects of the uh, hiatus. 
And if you look at warm extremes over land, they continue to increase, right? So summer temperatures over the land have continued to go up while the global mean temperature has kind of uh, leveled off. So that's another clue about what this might be about. So there are many explanations. A bunch of them have to do with the forcing of warming. The forcing of warming has been reduced in a couple of ways. The solar cycle declined over 2000 to 2011. That accounts for about a tenth of a watt per meter squared. Uh, increased volcanic activity, you can get 0.06 watts per meter squared from that, negative. A right? little bit more volcanic activity, a few more aerosols in the stratosphere of the atmosphere, some reflection of solar radiation. Less water vapor in the stratosphere, which is a greenhouse effect. But if you add those all up, it's not really enough to do the job. So in order to explain the reduction in warming over the last 15 years, you have to look for an increased heat uptake by the ocean over that period, right? So we're looking for about uh, six tenths of a watt per meter squared to slow down the warming. Uh, the things that we can find are not that big. So uh, we have to uh, think about the rate of which the ocean uptakes heat. And this is the picture of the climatological uptake of heat by the ocean. So where it's red, the ocean is taking in heat uh, at the surface. And where it's blue, heat is coming out of the ocean, going back into the atmosphere. So you can see that heat is stored in the ocean in the tropics, particularly so in the East Pacific Ocean there. And it goes back into the atmosphere in high latitudes, particularly in the western boundary currents in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. So um, there's a little bit of a debate in the community. Most the reigning view is that there's been a La Nina and the heat uptake in the equatorial eastern Pacific has increased. And that will be enough to slow down the warming. There's another point of view that less heat is coming out in the North Atlantic and the North Atlantic is storing heat. Either one of those things could be the ultimate explanation, but it's likely that they're coupled in some way uh, also. So, uh, so the <coughs> heat goes in where the tropical ocean is cold. This is ocean sea surface temperature. If you look uh, west of Peru there, uh, you can see that's a little bit red instead of uh, pink, and pink is the highest sea surface temperature. So that uh, heat is going in on the equator in the eastern Pacific where the sea surface temperatures are relatively low. Then uh, there's something that probably all Northwest climate experts know about. That's the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which has a pattern that looks a little bit like El Nino. There's warming in the equatorial East Pacific and cooling in the North Pacific. This has a significant impact on salmon and uh, uh, American climate. On the bottom is the time series of that uh, index on the top, and you can see that since about 2000 or so, it's been going more negative, right? That would mean that that red on the equator is actually blue, right? So the East Pacific is colder than normal at the present time. Uh, it's another picture of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, except showing the two phases, and we've been heading toward the cool phase, which is the one on the right. Cool in the East Pacific, blue on the bottom diagram there. So if you take a climate model and uh, you fix the temperature in the equatorial East Pacific at its observed values, and you do everything else exactly the same, then instead of getting the blue curve there, which is the standard forecast, you get the red curve, which is very close to the black curve, which is the observations, right? So modelers have shown that, okay, if I just constrain the sea surface temperature in the equatorial eastern Pacific, I can produce the hiatus, right? So it's one kind of argument that uh, tropical SST and the negative trend in the PDO has been one of the important contributors to the hiatus. And it makes sense 
because that would mean that the ocean is storing more heat. The ocean stores more heat during negative PDO than during positive PDO. Well, that raises an interesting question. So look at that time series of uh, the PDO with the negative phase recently, and there was also negative in the 50s and the 60s. And then you can line that up with the temperature anomaly as a function of time. And can you see a relationship between those two? Who can see a relationship between those two? You have to be able to take the gradient with time of the temperature and compare it to the sign of the PDO, right? Can you do that? No? No. Well, I don't have a pointer, so I can't help you. <laughs> Maybe this will work. So here's a flat period right here after 1940. Peak in 1940, flat period. Positive PDO, negative PDO. Rapid warming, positive PDO, less warming, negative PDO, right? So if you accept that as a hypothesis, then you have to attribute some of the rapid warming between 1980 and 2000 to the PDO, which is a natural internal variability. So what's next? Now there are two points of view in the scientific community, maybe, or at least it's fun to talk about that this might be the case. One group says, the predicted El Nino for this winter will break the La Nina cool PDO grip on global climate, usher in a period of renewed enhanced warming like that between 1980 and 1990, 1988. I have five minutes? Oh, I'm done. I went too fast. <clears throat> and the other view says <coughs> the current shift to more rapid ocean heat uptake will persist much longer. It's actually associated with deep circulations in the ocean. It's going to take a long time for this to turn around. And we'll have a long period of slow warming similar to the one uh, after 1940. But one thing, you have, uh, yeah, so you could do this. You could say, okay, uh, the one point of view is that it's going to continue more or less on the hiatus trend and it'll go up like that. Or you can say it's going to go up like the, the red line there between 1980 and 2000. Or you could say it's going to go up at the rate that it's been going up for the past century. That's kind of the range of possibilities, I would say, at the present time. And it'll be super interesting to see what actually happens. So there's one thing you have to remember, that in the, in the 1940s, the, well, okay, now I need to use my pointer. So uh, these are the radiative forcings in watts per meter squared associated with uh, various greenhouse gases. So CO2 is the big one. It's been increasing very rapidly. This is the rate of change of that forcing. Remember previously we were looking for forcings to explain the a hiatus and we needed six tenths of a watt to do it and we looked at volcanoes and it gave us one tenth of that, etc. Well, the uh, greenhouse warming due to greenhouse gases and mostly due to CO2 is three-tenths of a watt per meter squared, which is really pretty big. It's increasing by that amount, amount every decade, right? So it's not going to be like the 1940s because there's something very different. We're increasing the rate of greenhouse warming at a very, at a very high rate at the present time. Uh, this year, I guess, was I just heard on the radio this morning, the biggest increase in CO2 since 1984. Okay, working group two, in impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. I know you're all interested in that. And you can go to that website there for impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. It's a very complex topic. General summary is we've already seen some things. Uh, there are some things that happen in the future. And on balance, those things that happen in the future are bad. All right? That's the <laughs> summary. But it's very complicated because it impacts, climate impacts so many things. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. We have plenty of uh, time for questions for Dennis, so if anyone has any questions, please, uh, please go ahead. And there's uh, uh, an excellent uh, articulator. So raise your hand.
I haven't seen it actually. It it's very painful. <laughs> summarize it. Uh, it's exactly what you were talking about, hiatus wise. Uh, they're, uh -huh. they're using the last 20 years data as uh, climate change isn't happening. Now that's clearly not true. All right. <laughs> climate change is happening. Uh, the I rate of warming. Well, there uh, was also a recent article in an actual scientific journal, Nature, where an elaborate analysis was done, uh, takes into account heat uptake by the ocean and said, we don't really have to modify any of the basic conclusions of uh, IPCC AR5, that it's within the expectations. There's nothing wrong with the models, ser nothing seriously wrong with the models. So those statements are, are already out there. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, that's what they always do. <laughs> I think what she's saying is a, a lot of lay folk don't read journals like Nature, but they do read the Wall Street Journal. So w where I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but w we I think she's saying that we need a scientific response in journals like the Wall Street Journal that other people will actually read so that the facts are out there and not just the deniers. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal is unlikely to publish a rebuttal to that. I think. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, wh what we need are some journalists who are able to convey the facts in a way that people will take them in without uh, making the error of exaggerating too much in the other direction. I think if we exaggerate too much what we know in the long run, it uh, damages our credibility. So we have to sort of stick with what we know. Let's take a question here. Um. Can't hear you. Oh yeah. Okay. That's a very interesting point. So what the modelers have done is run an ensemble of simulations and then plot the average of those, which follows very closely the average that was observed. What, they s what you sometimes don't see is that within those simulations there are variabilities that are pretty big associated with the rate at which the ocean takes up heat and its interaction with the atmosphere and that natural variability. That natural variability might be a little bit underestimated because the ocean models have not adequate resolution, say, to do that. But I think the, they would make the argument that, well, the natural variability in the oceans is about right as far as we can tell from the observations that we have. So kind of the mistake Stake, I think the scientific community has not, is that they have not explained to people that there is natural variability in that uh, climate record, which maybe the modelers have overfit a little bit, possibly. Yeah. It's my point of view, not an official point of view. Yeah, following up on that question, you know, perhaps, you know, in the climate science community that we've kind of fudged on this notion of climate variability, climate weather, um, Superstorm Sandy, in other words, that we're trying to look for the smoking gun and when we start looking at individual events or short time periods of 10 or 20 years, uh, it's all conjecture. I mean, is, is that, you know, is that a proper notion? In other words, to create the distinctions of climate and climate variability uh, so that these anomalies are not proof or disproving anything. Yeah, within the debate, there's a tendency for people 
to see a particular event and say, aha, that shows global warming, or another particular event and say, aha, there isn't such a thing, right? And it's a slow process with a lot of natural variability on top of it, and we have to, we have to be very, very careful about making those sorts of statements on both, both sides of the uh, issue, if you think of it as an issue. Thanks. I'm just wondering if, uh, looking ahead, there's been discussion uh, about the impacts potentially of the rush to fracking on methane levels affecting any of the models. Uh, the recent news about uh, leaking of methane and to the Russian atmosphere. fracking? A rush to fracking. Rush to fracking? Oh, sure. Well, that's, um, you know, methane's a, uh, valuable, sort of, so I guess they try to capture as much as they can, but they are taking uh, methane out of the earth and r releasing it into the atmosphere, burning it mostly and forming uh, CO2. So it's contributing to the human-induced increase of greenhouse gases, but actually less so than if we were burning coal. I mean, there are other environmental issues related to fracking, but in terms of the CO2 problem, it's better than, it's better than burning coal. The U.S. Uh, production of greenhouse gases actually flattened off and declined a little bit because of the switch from coal, which had become more expensive, to fracked methane, which has been less expensive. So from the climate perspective, it's okay, except that it encourages our uh, continued uh, dependence on fossil fuels. I hope I didn't screw that up too bad. Um, we have a question way up on the balcony. Why don't we take that, if you can yell really loud. Yes, there are uh, lots of simulations uh, of uh, different scenarios and also how, how long it takes to recover. Uh, there's also uh, a, the working group three, which deals with mitigation, how you could actually uh, reduce fossil fuel consumption or s greenhouse gas release enough to actually slow things down. I think the, the story there is that once the CO2 is in the atmosphere, it stays for a very, very long time. So recovery is probably not a good word to use because unlike the ozone hole, which is going to decline over a period of 60 years or so, once we put CO2 in the atmosphere, it's there for centuries, maybe millennia. It takes a, a really, really long time to get back where we were. It's uh, effect, uh, effectively irreversible change. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but that's what came into my head when you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take one last, one, one last question. Uh, which kind of ties both of those two together. I was just going to um, recommend that maybe you look a little closer into the, the fracking issue because uh, in the Bakken region, which we traveled through, they're burning the methane. Uh, they're not bothering to capture it. It's too much trouble. Um, and so there's a lot of escaping, and being that it's about 50 times more of a uh, significant greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, I think we're going to see huge, huge increases in warming because uh -huh. of the, the fracking and m the methane alone there. So it might be worth looking into that piece to incorporate into your reports. You know, methane leveled off uh, and because the sources came into, the sinks came into balance with the sources, right? And so it's pretty close to probably as high as it can get. If you want an issue, maybe you should look at uh, sin fuels, um, tar sands, stuff like that. People used to think that, well, the oil is all going to be gone, and that's not going to be a problem. We just have to, let's just co concentrate on coal, coal. That was actually official Obama policy. But now that we're converting tar sands and things like that into g uh, liquid fuels, uh, liquid fuel is, again, an issue. Uh, for the long term, yeah? So think about that too. Okay, well, let's thank Dennis. Uh, it's good to have
Um, so 